Uh, well, it's 22 minutes to three o'clock. Delighted to say Hugh Grant has joined us live in the studio. Makes the live streaming worth watching uh, for once. Hello, Hugh. How are you? I'm lovely. Thank you very much. You look slightly nonplussed there just for a moment. People can actually watch this. That's the can thing. They? Yes. Am I on telly? Well, you're well, on the radio. Telly is a, 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 a sort of <laughs> old-fashioned <laughs> yes. thing, which we don't really talk about. Live really. streaming is how we like to refer to it oh, now. Okay, very well. If people go to the website, they can they can actually watch the interview. Normally, it's just me and Mark, and it flips from one to a middle-aged guy to another middle-aged guy. Yes. And now they have a good looking. Younger, That's pretty much my film. Actually. Younger, yeah, yeah, <laughs> younger, uh, middle-aged guy. We we're just talking about movies that um, that you sneak into when you are under age, and it tends to be Bruce Lee movies that we've had. Lots of people. Uh, Enter the Dragon. Every Enter movie. the Dragon at the age of fourteen. Lots yeah. of people trying to sneak in, but you you seem to have been a quite a good lad. Well, no, I, I as I say, I think it was The Exorcist, but certainly also the Emmanuel films were a big lure. What age did you see these movies? Mid forties, yes. <laughs> there you go. You see, that's all perfect. So, it was the first eighteen or X film you saw was The Exorcist. It might have been, yeah. But how old do you think you were? I don't remember, but I, I know but that I've been psychologically age? damaged. Was a, yeah, no, no, yeah, sure. But, yeah. but were you too young to see it, or did you actually see it legitimately? My problem with trying to get into those films, I remember, was that I looked much, much younger. I looked about six when I was, you know. 15. So it, my life was very difficult like that. It was difficult to get alcoholic drinks underage as you well. You needed makeup and false hair, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's what you needed. Yeah. Wearing a cravat, I always found, worked. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> got me into Blazing Saddles, worked perfectly well. Blazing They're, Saddles? Blazing Saddles. It was the yeah. first double A certificate film, and I, dr I dressed up for it. And because How I was old are you? I was 12, I'm 52 now. And but I was Mark, Mark, there's only one person in this room yes. who could get away with wearing a cravat, and mm. it's not you. It's not me, it's no. Not me. But on the other <laughs> hand, the classic in Hendon, it worked. They just went, yeah, fine, you bothered to put a cravat on. <laughs> of course, you can come in, nobody cares. Now, yeah. uh, Hugh's here, not just to uh, idly pass the time, uh, but he's, uh, he's talking about his new movie, which is called The Rewrite, and we've got a clip to play in just a moment. Just, um, I know you don't know what the clip is, and to be honest, I'm not quite sure, but I'm assuming that you're in it. Uh, but uh, tell us about the movie, tell us about your character, then we'll play the clip and we'll pick it up from there. Well, that won't work very well, because it could be from anywhere, but basically... Do you I'm want to hear the clip first, then? No, I think that'd be even worse. I, look, I, I play a, a screenwriter in Hollywood who once won an Oscar and has now fallen on hard times and can't get a job, and his agents, the only thing they can come up with is teaching screenwriting in a really crap university in the middle of nowhere America. And my character reluctantly does it, has a very bad attitude, gets drunk, is rude to everyone, shags the students, and then, uh, and then things look up slowly. And he, and he reforms, yeah, a, a little bit. Okay, well, uh, let's. You, you want to put some headphones on because I know how much you like uh, hearing and listening to clips of your own <laughs> uh, movies. Uh, here's a little bit from uh, from Hugh's new movie. What are you all majoring in then? I'm pre med. Really? And where do you stand on full body scans? Would you say helpful or would you say cancer causing cash conduits? Well, I mean, I nice think... alliteration. I'm an English major. I thought I recognised a fellow sufferer. And Chloe is majoring in uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, telepathy. I can't believe you wrote that movie. That's absolutely, truly cool. Nice assonance. Assonance is the repetition of vowel sounds. sounds. Hmm. Look at me, teaching already. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to take your course. Well, that's good news. I thought maybe no one would. Fantastic. And guess what happens next? <laughs> I think you can tell from the tone of one of your students there that uh, she's got the hots for you. Yeah, and uh, rather alarmingly, uh, we end up in bed that night. And uh, w what what alarms me was the reaction of audiences the next, uh, you know, when they see that. I hadn't realised I was now in that territory where it revolts people to see me, see a man it, of my age in bed with a young woman. Is that, well, how do you know that? I could feel... People bristling. Did they verbalise the bristling, or was it just, <laughs> just a sort of a change in the atmosphere? I don't know, just a slight sort of tension in the air. But maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so, was this at a screening? Was this at the premiere? Or? No, this was at uh, some test screenings. You know, you have these terrifying test screenings mm -hmm. when you make a film in America, and people fill out cards saying how much they liked it or didn't like it. So, did you go uh, along to a test screening? I always do. I'm very, very hands-on and interfering. I'm, throughout pre-production, production and post-production. 
And and how much do you take away from? Because I mean, a lot of filmmakers absolutely hate them, mm. and uh, some filmmakers say they're very very useful, particularly with comedies, because you can tell whether people are either laughing mm. or not. So how much do you take away from those test screenings? Well, I, I think the, the, that is the big thing with comedy. It does help to know did they laugh at that or didn't they, and or if you change an edit between one screening and the next, and you've lost a laugh, you know why? And I remember I went really mad on one film, and uh, you, you start to realise just how delicate things are. It would be a, a scene which gets a laugh, gets a laugh every screening, and then you change the background music that was playing in the jukebox, and it's not even mixed very loud. Laugh gone. It's comedy is such a delicate thing. So when you say you're very hands on mm. all the way through, yeah. you, you smile as though. This has been a bone of contention just a little, or maybe it's probably... I don't know. So what does that mean if if, if you, as the star of this movie, are very hands-on in production and post-production and, uh, and so on? Does that mean you sit in on the edit, or what does that mean? Well, not there every day, but I tend to work with people who uh, I've worked with before and who I actually, I think, in some ways, quite like my opinion. And... Uh, so then this is a case in point, this film. I made lots of films with Mark before. and This is the fourth with him. Yeah, yep. yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, we, he's very collaborative, very very nice, and, and I feel much more comfortable that way. Apart from anything else, it makes me less nervous. I don't really like just being the wheeled-on actor who comes and says their lines. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with that, uh, in that role. Were you quite difficult to get on this movie? Um, well, only in the sense that I try not to do too many films anymore and I sort of have other things in my life, you know, politics, etc. Uh, but given that Mark had written it specifically for me and given that I thought it was funny and touching, uh, I, it wasn't really that hard. And since you, sorry, since you play a screenwriter in it, did you work with him on the screenplay? Did you rewrite the rewrite? <laughs> no, I mean, I, don't re I didn't rewrite any of it. I just uh, give notes and then another draft appears and more notes and another draft appears. Um, that's sort of how it works. And then, you know, on the set, you do... We tend to do a few takes where you're sticking exactly to the script and then you do some where you might mess around a bit. And, and it's surprising, not just on this film, or, but on any film, how often ad-libs do end up in the final cut because yeah. the camera, more than anything in the world, loves freshness and hates staleness I hate something being repeated it can sort of see it instantly and anything that pops out in the moment is usually very valuable and one of the things I noticed when I first went to America and did films was how much more improvisation American actors did they were much yeah. less slavish to the text than uh, British actors who were brought up uh, quite sort of strict theatrical or BBC style you know you learn your line love <laughs> learn your lines love and you, and you say them and American actors are much wilder. Yeah, although there is a, another side of that, which is that there are certain American comedies now which just look like they just made everything up on, you know, <laughs> end, and then you'll get the gags outtake reel at the end, which is funny. And it's like, I would I would like the script. I mean, improvisation yeah. is fine, but there's yeah. a certain reverence for the script is necessary. Well, in it depends. It depends on the script, clearly. But I, I agree. I mean, there, there is a style where you just get in some very funny people. You look at Bridesmaids. That's basically a lot of very funny people. Uh, improvising with a good director in charge. Oh, sure. Yeah. On the subject of screen writer, which the role uh, you're playing, it occurred to me during the movie that we know the the average. I'm talking about the average cinema going uh, crowd will know stars, will know about directors. Screenwriters aren't really a known group of people, are they? Uh, are you say that? Yes, I do. <laughs> who are the who are the best screenwriters that we should know about that you have worked with? Well, I the, the screenwriter, I... Well, I mean, obviously Richard Curtis is a screenwriter that people would have seen lots of his films. And rather like Mark Lawrence, for a long time, other people directed his work, and they both of them had to sit there. Very, They're both very polite people, but I think it was inward bleeding, you know, when they thought, oh, that joke's not playing right if you put the camera there. So they both took over and, and directed films in the end. Uh but, I mean, famous screenwriters who people might have heard of, they'll certainly have heard of Bill Goldman, uh, who's... There you go. I'm just holding up uh, William Goldman's book, Which Lie Did I Tell? Um, yeah. And I'd... Bill's quite, become quite a friend. He's a great friend of Castle Rock, who made this film, by the way. Uh, and uh, he's... Uh, I, I love Bill, because he, you know... His great catchphrase is, Let me tell you, no one knows anything. They don't know anything. Have you ever worked with him? Um, well, he has had a, had a say and gives notes on a lot of the films I've done, yeah. 
because of his connection with Castle Rock, so that, so which you, is Rob Reiner's company, right? Uh, and Liz yeah. Glotzer and Shawshank Redemption, and yes, yeah, all that. Yeah. So that would so you so you would get a script and then you would show it to him. The and ones the ones I've made through Castle Rock, where I used to have a you know a deal as they call it, uh, a production deal. They uh, he was always involved in script discussions on every film they made. So that would include the ones I did. Yes. So, okay, I, I, I think I just think that's intriguing. I just love the way the, uh, in piecing together how a movie is made. Yeah. So you're in uh, one of those movies like Notting Hill, yeah. and you get the script, and then you, we, we, and we remember the cast. We remember it's a Richard Curtis movie. Yeah. Uh, and we just it's fascinating to know who else has got some input from elsewhere. Well, I mean, on the Richard ones, uh, that, that certainly wasn't Bill Goldman or anyone like that. But there were people. Uh, his great uh, script editor is his wife, or Emma Freud. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were talking about William Goldman there for a moment. Yeah, Emma you know, Freud edits William Goldman scripts as well. She's that's that's, that's that's you know, and is Emma Freud married to William Goldman oh, as but well? Apparently, yes. It's because it's two sides of the Atlantic, so it doesn't count. But it's, 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 a, it's a rule, it, I, I hear. So here's a thing from William Goldman's book. Yeah. I just want to run this past you and yeah. see, if, see if it's true. Right Here it is about stars. Okay, mm. Stars are not, not what you think. They are not remotely what the world believes them to be either. Most of them are smaller than you think, and all of them are more frightened than you think. And don't ever forget that if you're lucky enough to work with them. <laughs> so are you smaller than most people think, and are you more frightened well, than Bill, we Well, Bill is obsessed with the height of yes. stars. So he sits by the pool in Cannes, <laughs> measuring film stars as they get out of the pool. It's, it's, uh, it's almost a sort of psychosis with him. How uh, tall is he? He's in pretty good shape, actually, and quite tall. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, but he, I think, you know, I've read that book and other books he's written, and he does have uh, an axe to grind about some stars who've come and screwed up his lines he through does. their sort of vanity. Are most stars more scared than we would think? Yeah, they're terrified. And, well, certainly the ones who are difficult uh, are always just... It's just a symptom of terror. Um, you know, I've worked with actors and actresses who won't come out of their trailer and there's endless fussing about hair or the costume or whatever it is, and you think, what a nightmare, what a diva, but really all it is is they're terrified. I remember working with one who finally broke down in tears and said, but you don't understand, it's just because I'm so frightened. Who is that? I, I, I can't. Couldn't possibly. No. And are you, are you fairly well behaved? Do you, you have a sort of strict work and you don't do any of that stuff? Mm -hmm. No, I no, I uh, very early on. I was late on set once in a Merchant Ivory film. I went to the pub uh, sort of for a break when I was, you know, and was late back on the set, and I just felt so bad. They have you know no money on those films anyway, and uh, it was an awful experience. And so I, I know I'm a very good boy about punctuality. On the subject of writing, there is a subject. There's a scene in um, in the film in which your character has won an Oscar for a previously for a thing called uh, Paradise uh, mis uh, Misplaced, and uh, he he looks himself up on Google and he sees a younger version of himself doing an acceptance speech, which is of course cold from your own acceptance <laughs> speech at the Golden Globes. And what I wonder about that speech, which is very funny, was it written for? Did you write? Was it because you, you give the impression of just making it up on the spot? But it looks like a piece of written comedy. Well, I, I I did write down some notes beforehand in a hotel room, but it's it is my work. And what's it like watching yourself watching yourself receiving that award from all those? It's a is it a strange thing? Uh, it's, I didn't want that to be in the film at all. I when my character in this film looks back at that at his, his younger self, I wanted us to film that, and we did film it with me with a wig and clips on my face. <laughs> and it just looked like me with a wig and clips on my face. So very reluctantly, I allowed them to use that uh, Golden Globes thing. Because, um, you know, I cling to the belief that I actually play roles in these films and that, that, that that's not me. Um, it, the, you know, this, this part I play in this film is not me, whereas that, you know, the Golden Globes guy is unequivocally me. Did you And did you enjoy this movie-making process? Did it make you think... Yep, I could. I, I should be doing more of this. Or did you hate it the way you have hated it in the past and think, I just would rather be concentrating on activism <laughs> rather than actoring? Um, no, well, I did quite enjoy it because I love the people involved. As I said, they're all old friends. And these, I, for some reason, I've ended up making lots of films in New York. So I seem to know every grip and electrician, and that's all very cosy. This is Binghamton, New York. Well, it's set in Binghamton, but actually, we filmed it in another university in Long Island. And. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was fun and it was quick. And the nice thing about this film was that it was not, there was no studio involved. So there was no one breathing down our necks. And 
giving notes and... Uh, how, do, how does that work? How do you make a movie without a studio then? Well, it was privately financed, uh, which I'd never come across that. Uh, or maybe I had in my very early days. Uh, but it's brilliant. It just means there's, you don't have to kowtow to anyone. And you, you've you been quoted in the past as saying, you know, you hate seeing yourself or you've hated most of the movies that you've been involved. I don't know if that's a true, accurate quote. No, that's nonsense. I was, I was just making a silly remark at the premiere the other day. I can't remember what I said. Something like... Uh, um, but I can't remember what I said. But I mean, I certainly don't hate them. There are some I I like a lot. What are your favourites? Well, I I like about a boy, um, and I like uh, I mean, I'm barely in it, but I think Remains of the Day is a bloody good film. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I don't know. There are lots. I mean, I you know. Uh, Plenty. And does the taking control of your own, you know, you talked about being very hands on, does mm. that date back? To, I mean, it's extreme measures is one of the sort of earliest things of you, of you as a producer. Is that where it sort of really begins that you take control of it? Yeah. When, when after four weddings suddenly propelled me from obscurity into, you know, having some success, uh, one of the things that suddenly was laid in front of me was the opportunity to have a production deal with the studio. And uh, I went and met various studios. At, in Los Angeles, but the one I really loved was this Castle Rock, Rob Reiner's company. They were just seemed bright and not very Hollywood. And uh, so, yes, we I, then they pay for an office and you develop scripts, and we made extreme measures uh, with them, which was actually, it, it was written by uh, a protege of, of Bill Goldman's, um, who's gone on to become a very good film director. And now, I'm in a panic and I forgot. <laughs> Talk to Simon, I'll look him up. Uh, right, uh, Ed Kilworth on Twitter. Hugh, have you ever considered going into mainstream politics full-time and do films on the side a bit like Arnie? Uh, no. But you are... Well, well actually, I mean, having said that, that is pretty much what I've been doing yeah, for the so, last three years. Was, so it has taken you... So the activism has taken you away from the acting. I, yeah, I thought it would be like one week of... I wrote an article and did a couple of interviews and it's turned into three years of hardcore sort of battling. And we, are you planning to continue that? Well, it would certainly have started, so I'll finish. Uh, and there's, you know, it's not... What's the finish? Time. Well, I think there will be a moment towards the end of next year. It's it's highly technical and relatively boring, but it, it, that will, when it will come to a head. And is the... Uh, this might not even really be the same issue, but the pictures of Jennifer Lawrence and other stars that have turned up mm. online, and Jennifer Lawrence is quoted uh, saying, you know, this isn't... Uh, this is abuse, really, rather than anything else. Um, is this the same issue that you're campaigning about, or is it just a tangential issue? Um, it's tangential. Uh, especially because I think people often think that what uh, the campaign I've been involved with is something to do with intrusion on celebrities, and actually it's nothing to do with that, or at least that's the sort of lowest priority out of 100 priorities. It's, it's really to do with who runs the country... And the abuse of power, and uh, and especially the 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 abuse of people who are not celebrities, but actually uh, often quite vulnerable, like people who've lost children in accidents or terrorist atrocities and things like that. On the subject of bad behaviour, which we were talking about, just are mm. you still banned from the from the Daily Show in America? I don't know. It's a good point. I I, I have no idea. Because John Stewart said you, I think he said you were the worst guest he'd ever had, and we've had dictators on this show, and he sort of banned you from life, banned you for life. I know, I know. What did I you know. do? Well, it turns out that I did have, I did have a bit of a mini tanty backstage. A mini tanty? Yeah, I did a bit. They they were playing a clip, and the film was not working very well anyway, so it's always a bit of a grind if the film's not working. And they were playing a clip, and they they'd cut the joke out, and some producer told me that beforehand, and I was cross with her. And uh, he quite rightly defended her. Uh, Jimbo on Twitter, were you disappointed by the reception to Cloud Atlas? Because personally, I loved it. Yes, uh, I am obviously disappointed. And I'm such an admirer of the Wachowskis, and you can't get braver than that as filmmakers, yeah. especially to take on that novel. And um, yeah, that was very, very sad. Because they're, you know, they're a rare example of people who really make cinema as opposed to blown up TV. The writer you were trying to mention, uh, remember, was Tony Gilroy. Of yes, course, who wanted Tony to do Gilroy. Michael yes. Clayton. In, yes. in the case of uh, Cloud Atlas, the interesting thing about it is, it takes two, three screenings for that for the film to to work for the <laughs> audience. And no, no, I know that because mm. when I read it when it came out and said, you know, it's really ambitious, but it doesn't work. And everyone mm. and I got a lot of emails from people saying, no, no, try it again. And the second time I tried, it still didn't, but it was something there. By the third time, 
I'd really grown to like it, but it is a very dense, very com unbelievably ambitious film that requires an audience to have a couple of runs at it. Yeah. And, and, and I think a lot of people didn't make it through the first run. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. No. Uh, is it Man from Uncle next? I am is in The Man true? from Uncle. No, not in a major part, but I am in it. And uh, I don't know. I think it could be quite stylish and cool. Is it still uh, Ilya Kuryakin and Napoleon Solo? Yes. I but I'm a, their boss, Waverly. I had a Man From U.N.C.L.E. badge. Yes, and I had oh, a Man, man From U.N.C.L.E. car. You press the top and they poke their guns out of the side. That's true. I yeah. had one of those. It was a blue, it was a blue car. Yes, blue car. This is a fantastic. And when does that come out? I think it's January here. Waverly was an old guy on the TV series. I am, what an, are you? I am an old guy. Oh, OK. Uh, Hugh Grant, we appreciate you coming in. Thank you very much indeed.